in the back of your Bibles. We'll be considering the last two verses together tonight. Before we do that, let's ask for God's help. Our Lord God, you speak to us, and it is a great mercy and a great blessing. We pray that you would speak to us now in your word, that you would open my mouth, that it might be proclaimed, explained, applied, but that it might not just be an intellectual thing, but that we might see you in your word with the eyes of our hearts. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Jude, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. This little passage leads us to praise and to prayer. It is, in fact, a prayer, but it begins by exalting our God, and then it moves on in the end to requests to our God. Praise and prayer, if you will, directed to our saving God, because right there in the center is to God our Savior. And when we think of God our Savior, oftentimes we think of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that uh, this is referring to the whole Trinity. Uh, we don't need to limit it to the Lord Jesus in this particular place, and it's uh, the whole Trinity is referred to as our Savior in, in various places in the New Testament. So we're thinking here about God, our, our Savior, and, and we'll think about how that is our Trinity in a little while. Now, as we approach it, we might be tempted to think that's all great to think about the glories of God to, to pray uh, for His dominion and power and glory and majesty, but I've got challenges and difficulties in my week ahead. How is that going to, to help me very much with those things? I want to just remind you, perhaps you don't need the reminding, but uh, it's helpful nonetheless, that actually what you need the most in the midst of your everyday life is to be filled with the glories of your God um, and to be drawn out of yourself in prayer to Him for His glory. Then our troubles and trials are put into perspective. Then we see the resources that we need and indeed that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we see the light at the end of the tunnel, or we see the glorious hope that should energize all our serving and fighting and living, regardless of our circumstances. So, my theme tonight is simply praise and prayer to our saving God. Praise and prayer to our saving God, and I want to first think about praise and then about prayer. In the passage, we have this wonderful phrase, God our Savior. If you think with me for just a moment about that word, Savior, as I said, this is um, praise, and what we're being called to do here is to savor our saving God. And this is the way that praise or doxology works. We sing the praises of people, as it were, that we respect, that we love, that we delight in. And these verses give us the opportunity to see the loveliness 
of God, the glory of God, so that we might savor Him and delight in Him and grow in our love and, and respect for Him. And this is, as I mentioned, the, the whole Trinity, and, and the whole Trinity has a part in our salvation, does He not? It was God the Father who, who loved us before the foundation of the world and sent His Son in to the world in time. It's the Son who um, agreed in, in that eternal covenant to come and to be our Savior and to take on human flesh and a, and a reasonable soul and to endure all the indignities of the life that He lived for us, to, to die on our behalf for our sins, for the sins of all of His people. And it is the Spirit that applies the redemption that we have in Christ to us, that, that opens our minds and, and gives us new hearts and, and draws us to Christ that we might receive Him and rest upon Him as He's offered in the gospel, that, that takes what is Christ and, and gives it to us. Um, Calvin famously uh, says in his institutes that all that is in Christ is, is of no good to us if it's not applied to us. If it remains outside of us, it's wonderful in and it of itself, but it's no good to us. And it's the work of the Spirit to take Christ and to apply Him to us that we might know the forgiveness of sins, the, the sanctification, uh, the adoption, the, the um, future hope and inheritance and all that we have in Christ. So, so God as Trinity is, is our saving God, and I believe that is what is in focus here in this verse. What does He save us from? Well, we could answer that in all sorts of ways, but I want to answer it in, in three ways, which are classic ways. We are saved from the devil. Uh, we sometimes confess in our morning service with the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism that he, Christ, has delivered us from the tyranny of the devil. Each one of us was born under the cruel authority of the devil. We are born slaves to, to sin, and, and the power of the devil is sin through the law. And so we were his uh, slaves, those who were bound uh, under his cruel will. And in Christ's death and resurrection, the power of the devil over us has been broken. He can no longer accuse us with, with any reasonableness before the throne of God because our sins have been paid for and His power utterly broken. We are able to push back against Him. We are, we are able to say no to His temptations. We are able to reject His accusations against us, all because of what God has done for us in the redemption which He has provided for us. And then there is the salvation which God has provided for us from this world, this world that is in rebellion against God. He has chosen us out of it. He has, he has in time, drawn us to Himself so that we are not like our fellows, uh, continually going our own way in rebellion against God, but we have uh, been given repentance, and a turning unto God so that we might know Him and love Him and, and, and serve Him. And He keeps us pure. He enables us to live differently, to, to think differently, to structure our, our lives and our decisions and our, our families differently uh, in line with God's ways, in, in purity, in contradistinction to this world. And one day He will deliver us fully from this world when He comes again in glory in His Son and this world is purified by fire from all that is unrighteous and it is renewed and all that's in opposition, all that is the world in opposition to God is 
cast into eternal judgment, and we are separated from it forever. We are delivered from the devil. We are delivered from the world. We are delivered, saved from our sin. And this is perhaps the most crucial. Uh, Our sin is what will rob us most, I think, of our joy and comfort and victory in the Lord. Sin, um, perhaps mostly even in its respectable character, uh, the, the anger that can creep in um, towards our children, uh, the frustration towards a spouse, or the pride of self-reliance, or uh, the pride in, in relation to someone else or some other type of, of people, perhaps those who have less accurate theology than ourselves. Perhaps it's not in that area, but it's in insecurity or discontentment or anxiety. All these are, are sins. All these, in various ways, cause us to rebel against God and and there are many others that we could add to them, but these and, and all these sins rob, rob us of our joy and comfort and victory in the Lord. And what God has done is He has saved us from these things. He's saved us from the penalty of them. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins these, these things that we so easily excuse, perhaps in our own lives, God doesn't excuse. They're, they're heinous in His eyes. They're an affront to Him. They deserve everlasting torment in hell. And yet He has sent His Son to experience the hell that we deserve so that His righteous wrath for these things might be turned away. He has delivered us from the penalty of our sins. But He's also delivering us from the power of our sins. Isn't that wonderful good news that He's our our Savior not only to remove God's righteous wrath and the danger of hell, but that in the here and now we might have more victory over them this week, tomorrow, when we're tempted to fall into these same sorts of ruts that we so easily fall into. Romans 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Or I love at the end of the book of Micah, this little phrase, He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You think about the iniquities that you particularly struggle with. Isn't it good news? What is God doing in your life? He's subduing those things. The almighty God of the universe, the saving God of the universe. If you are His, He's subduing your sins. He saves us from the penalty of of sin, the power of sin. One day we shall even be saved from its presence. That's taught to us even right here in our text where it talks about how He is able to present us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Present us faultless. Won't it be a wonderful wonderful day when we stand there completely cleansed practically of all of our sins, every single last one. It's almost too good to imagine. We're so used to having sin. We never live a day. We never go a day without sin. Everything we do is some in some way or other tainted with sin. It's almost beyond our comprehension to Think about a a time when sin shall be no more and we shall have nothing more to do with it whatsoever, forever and ever and ever and ever. But that's the salvation that God, our saving God, has 
is and will work for us. What sweetness that should bring us all of this in our own battle with anger, with self-pity, with self-reliance, or whatever your particular struggle is. And there is a sense in which God is the Savior of the world as, as well. Uh, here I'm thinking about that in terms of the, the natural um, world. I, I don't obviously mean that in a, in a moral sense, but we read in Romans 8, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There is a sense in which the redemption that God worked in Christ applies outwards to all creation, and, and it's saved in the removing of the curse that was put on it because of the sin of our first father. And in some ways, uh, this is particularly in focus here, uh, where we read in verse 25, uh, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. That, that, that larger um, God taking full dominion over everything is in particular in, in focus here in these verses. So, God is our Savior. But notice that it's not only that He's our Savior, but He is our Savior. We sometimes think of Him as the King, or as the Prime Minister, or as, as some far away great mighty figure who we have some knowledge of, and maybe even quite a bit knowledge of, in these days, we know quite a lot about public figures because of 24-hour uh, media and that sort of thing, um, but we don't actually know them personally. And sometimes we think of God like that, but no. The Scriptures speak of Him as our Father. Not everyone has a good relationship with their Father, but, but for those who do, it's a sweet, glorious relationship. And that's the way in which the Scriptures present God to us as, as our protector, our guide, uh, the one who has compassion upon us. The Scriptures present God to us as our spouse, our friend even. And they tell us that we are adopted into the family of God, given all the privileges of the children of God. We are united to Christ personally, really, spiritually, so that all of our salvation comes to us not just simply by bank transfer, but because we are, we are joined to Him. We, we are connected to a real person. Uh, just like uh, when someone is, is adopted into a family, they get all the benefits of that family because they, of that relationship with uh, those that couple that's adopted them. And of course, we have the Spirit who dwells within us that makes this God personal to us. God is not just far off in heaven, but He is really within us by His Holy Spirit. He is with us. He's for us. He's at work in us. And when we see Him out at work in the world, we are seeing Him as our King, as our God, the one whom we know personally who is at work. So He's our Savior. He's our Savior personally. And He is wise. He is the only wise Savior, or um, as the New King James puts it, to God our Savior, who alone is wise. And I think what's being said here is that um, he, is, he is the only one who is perfectly wise. We might sometimes wonder why the situation that we're in doesn't make sense. We might feel like we can't handle the circumstances that we're in right now. What we're going through might not seem good. 
we might wonder, God, why have you put me in this situation? Why have I made the mistakes in my life that I have made? Why have you allowed me to do that? Why have the friends that have left me, left me, why have you allowed that to happen? Isn't it a comfort to know that God is our only wise Savior? He is our perfectly wise Savior. That all that befalls us is perfectly fit for us in the good and glorious and wise counsels of God. We in our finite understanding may not be able to comprehend that, but God in His infinite wisdom is giving us just what we need, what is good for us, what, what will work for our salvation and for His glory and uh, for our eternal joy joy in Him. And one day we shall rejoice in these things that now seem so dark and perplexing to us. But it is a great comfort that we may look to Him as our perfectly wise Savior. Based on this, then, it should come as no surprise to us that He is able to keep us from stumbling. We've been savoring God's work of salvation, and here we read that He is able to keep us. Just like Christ said, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all He has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. That is the purpose of God, and what we read here is that He is able, that He has the, the power to accomplish what He purposes. That shouldn't surprise us, right? Because He's God. Uh, he is infinite in, in all that He is. Uh, we're not like that. We purpose all sorts of things, and we may or may not have the power to accomplish them. But He, as infinite God, is always able to do that which He purposes and He purposes to keep us if we are in Him. But let that sink in for a moment. If you think about it, are there not thousands of reasons why you might stumble? Can you not find all sorts of reasons in your own heart that might draw you away from the Lord? Is your heart not desperately deceptive and, and wicked? Is the devil not mighty and strong, much stronger than you? Is he not clever? Has he not been at his work of seeking to draw people away from God for thousands of years? Are there not real pressures and distractions in this world? Do you not find that your love for Christ is much weaker than you would long for it to be? Do you not have a record of, of many trips and falls already in your, your Christian life? If you stop and think about it, what's surprising is that we don't fall. There's so many reasons why we might fall away from the Lord. It seems like a very likely thing, in fact. Except the fact that Almighty God is able to keep us. This God of salvation is wisely working in our life, in your life, if you are His. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, saving you from the world, the flesh, and the devil subduing your sins, and he is infinite in his power and wisdom and mind, and therefore he is able to keep you from stumbling. He is much greater, much more powerful than all those thousands of reasons why you might stumble. 
In addition, based on the things that we have considered about our God as Savior, He is able to present us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Again, if you know your own heart, you know that there are all sorts of reasons why the presence of the glory of God might not be a joyful place for you. You see all sorts of ways that you've offended God in your life. Indeed, woe to you, woe to you, if you do not see anything that would prevent you from standing before the glory of God with exceeding joy. The glory of God is is His awesome, awful, burning holiness, pure beyond measure, brighter than the brightest, whitest light, consuming all impurity before it like a raging fire. And again, if you honestly look into your heart, you will find all sorts of reasons why you might want to run in terror from the presence of the glory of God rather than stand there in exceeding joy. But He is able. He is able because He has united you to Christ. He has really dealt, really dealt with all those impurities that you have just been thinking about. Christ suffered for them. He drank the cup of the wrath of God for those things. And He was able to do it because He is truly God and truly man. You have the Spirit of God who has applied Christ to you and is applying Christ to you, has applied to you His perfect life of righteousness so that when God looks at you, He sees the glorious, beautiful righteousness of His beloved Son, the perfect man. And so, He is able to cause you to stand before His glory, that intensely pure, holy glory, not with fear, not with terror, but with joy, joy in the salvation that He has worked for you. Joy in all that it declares about God's purity and His character. Joy in the fact that He has loved you with an everlasting love in order to purify you, to stand there. He is able to make you stand before His glory with exceeding joy. And I think sometimes we actually doubt that. We let the guilt of our sin consume us too much and we don't look away to Christ enough. We think it too good to be true. But the plain declaration of His Word is that He is able to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Believe that. We have this wonderful, saving God. What a God. Our God. Wise in His work with us, in His salvation able to keep us from stumbling, able to present us before His glory with exceeding joy.
But the passage doesn't stop there. It goes on and it requests. It says, Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And I want to simply look at the, the nature of, of this prayer and the content of the prayer. What are we actually saying? What, what are we saying when we say, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever? I think we're doing at least three things. We, we are ascribing things to God, we are praying for their greater revelation, and we are praying for uh, an increase of, of their tangible reality in, in this world. We're ascribing glory to God in that we're recognizing what is true about Him. And we're, we're praying for the greater revelation of, of these things. Uh, we want the world to see it. We, we want it to be… Gr- we want these things to be more manifest, uh, like uh, we read of Paul praying in Ephesians chapter 1, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. He is praying for a greater revelation of these things. Or as we say, uh, be glory and majesty, dominion and power. I think we're, we're praying for that greater revelation for ourselves and for others. Uh, We see it as well, even in the Lord's Prayer that we prayed earlier together, hallowed be thy name. Or we see it in places like Isaiah 64, oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence as fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries. So it's not only to us, uh, but it's also to the adversaries of God. So we're praying, we're in ascribing these things to God, we're praying for the greater revelation of them, and then we're we're praying for an increase of His glory. Uh, Not that God's glory can actually increase, He is immutable, He doesn't change, uh, but we're, we're praying for, for a greater tangible expression of these things in this world. Not just that people might see His glory and majesty and dominion and power, but it, it might actually grow, as it were. Like, again, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for things like the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. We're, we're praying for God's glory and majesty, dominion and power to be um, tangibly increased in the salvation of men, women, and children, of their sanctification. So, what are we doing here? We're ascribing to God these things. We're seeking for the greater revelation of these things at large in the world and to ourselves, and we're seeking for a tangible increase of these things. Now, what is the exact content of these things that we're ascribing, praying for a greater revelation of an increase of? Well, we're praying for God's glory. Uh, We're ascribing this to Him and praying for its revelation and increase. What is that? His character. We're praying of His love, of His graciousness, of His forgiveness, of His justice, of His power, His faithfulness, etc. His majesty is His glory as King. His dominion, of course, is, is His rule in our lives and the lives of others in His church, as His church is brought more in conformity to the Word, His Word. Even that the governments of this world might be more 
in conformity to his truth, that institutions in our society and culture might be more brought in conformity to his truth, that the ideas that, that we think um, in our culture at large might be more purified in, in relation to the truth of God. And all of this is a tangible expression of his dominion and his power. And we're asking for these things to be true forever. I think we get that quite easily, right? We, we know that one day Christ is going to come and that all that is opposed to him is going to be swept away and he will restore all things and rule forever and ever. And, and so it's quite easy for us to pray for uh, his glory and majesty and dominion and power forever because, because that's separate from our current time and, and it, we can easily just put it beyond his second coming when everything is put under his feet. What's really astounding is that we're to pray for these things now and forever. We're to pray that his, his dominion would grow in Newcastle. We are to pray that he would be seen as more majestic now. And that his glory would be more recognized. So, as we pray this, we, we ascribe glory, majesty, dominion, and power to God because these things are true of him. We pray that the world might see it more clearly and we pray that these things might become more tangibly expressed in our world now and forever. As I close, I just want to challenge you with two things very briefly. I want to challenge you this week to praise God in the way that we see here. All that we've thought about in the first part of the sermon of his saving work that is personal, that is wise, that is able to keep us from stumbling, that is able to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I, I want you to praise God like that. So often it's easy for us to, to become so constrained and small-minded in our views of God in our prayers. So I, I want to say to you, this week as you get down on your knees in the morning, as you're going about your work and, and you stop for a moment to pray, praise God in great expanded terms like we see here for being our saving God. And then secondly, I want you to pray to God in, in this way this week. Ascribe to him dominion and power and majesty and glory this week. Pray that your family and your co-workers might see that, that it might be revealed to them more clearly. Pray that his kingdom actually would come, that his will would be done on earth, in Newcastle, in the UK, as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Lord God, we can only thank you. What an amazing God you are. What an amazing salvation you have provided for us. And you are also glorious and majestic beyond our imagining. And we want to see the world recognize that. We want to see those who are blind now have their eyes opened. We want even your enemies to, to have to recognize that. We, we want to see your work. And so we pray for it. We, we pray, Lord God, to you who are God, our Savior, with the confidence that you will keep us from falling 
with the confidence that you will present us before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy. And we pray that to you would be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. And we pray it through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.